Hello everyone, let's do another graph. We're going to construct the graph of the function x times e to the power of minus x. Again, first step is to compute the domain. For this function, there's no denominator, so you're not going to get any division by zero. There's no roots, sorry, there's no even roots, and there's no logarithmic term. So this function is actually defined everywhere, so on the whole real line. And as an interval, that's minus infinity to infinity. So there's two open endpoints, minus infinity and plus infinity. So again here, we're going to get two important limits to set up and to compute. So boom, the limit as x approaches minus infinity of x times e to the minus x. And the second one, the limit as x goes to infinity of x e to the power minus x. So again, another function defined everywhere. Okay, so uh, one of those limits uh, will be done directly. The other one will be done using hospital rule. And that's basically the point of that example. Sometimes in these important limits, you need to sum them, sum up, sum on those, those uh, more advanced tool. So, all right, so for the first one, if you just plug in, if you just plug in infinity, minus infinity, you get minus infinity times e to the minus minus infinity which is minus infinity times e to the plus infinity, e to the infinite is infinite. So you get minus infinity times infinity, and it's all good, you just get minus infinity. So as x goes to minus infinity, the function will go down forever. No horizontal asymptote. Now if you plug in infinity, you're going to get infinity times e to the power of minus infinity. That's infinity times zero, and infinity times zero, uh-oh, that's bad. So it's a bad product, so what you need to do is flip one of the two term. If one of them is the exponential function, you're always going to go and bring that one down by changing its sign. So the limit to define here is if you bring e x, if you bring e to the minus x down, it's going to become e x at the denominator. So the limit as x goes to infinity of x times e to the minus x is the same as the limit as x goes to infinity of x over ex. And of course, if you plug infinity in there, you're going to get infinity over infinity. So that's that's pretty bad, but it's not as bad in the sense that uh, you can now use hospital rule on that one. So you apply hospital rule. So if you compute the derivative of x, you're going to get one. And if you compute the derivative of ex, you're going to get ex again. So you get the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over e x. And now if you plug infinity, you get 1 over uh, e to the power of infinity, which is infinity. 1 over infinity is 0. Whoa. What does that mean now? If you are getting closer to a number, if your limit is goes to a number as you go to infinity, then this means that you have a horizontal asymptote at y equal zero. So we'll have to draw that when we're going to uh, construct the graph of our uh, function. So the derivatives now, so we have x multiplying e to the minus x. I'm going to use a product rule. So the derivative of x is just 1 times e to the minus x plus the first function, which is just x, times the derivative of e to the minus x. So this, little, this is a little chain rule. So we get e to the minus x times the derivative of minus x, which is minus 1. If you simplify this, and this is very typical, remember this, this is very important. If you have um, uh, an expression with a bunch of exponential term, you can factor out the exponential term, leaving behind 1 minus x. And that's your first derivative. Now for the second one, I'm going to use product rule again. Um, now if you derive... If you differentiate e to the minus x by using chain rule, you're going to get e to the minus x times the inside derivative, which is minus 1, times 1 minus x, plus the first function, e to the minus x, times derivative of the second one, derivative of 1 minus x is just minus 1. If you factor by e to the minus x again, very typical, you're going to leave behind minus 1 times 1 minus x minus 1. And if you simplify this a little bit more, you're going to get e to the minus x times x minus 2. 
always make sure in these questions that you simplify because the simpler your f prime and f prime prime are, the simpler step four and step five are going to be. Now let's find critical points with these freshly computed f prime and f prime prime. When is it undefined? Well, for f prime, there's no denominator, there's no roots, there's no logarithmic term, so this is never going to be undefined. Uh, when is it going to? When is f prime going to be equal to zero? Again, here by inspection, we only have two terms, so we have e to the minus x. But remember, an exponential term is always strictly positive. The only way this can be equal to zero is if one minus x is equal to zero, and this is going to happen if and only if x is equal to one. So we found our first critical point for f. That's when f prime is equal to zero. Now for the second derivative. So using the same logic here, it's never going to crash. And when is it going to be equal to zero? You ignore the, um, the exponential term, okay? And you just wonder when is the x minus two going to be equal to zero? Well, this is going to happen if x is equal to two. So we have two important points that will be used in our super sign table. So in order, the first one is one. The reason why one is there is because we have a zero for f prime, and then we have also two here because f prime prime is equal to zero. And then we wonder what's going to happen before, so from minus infinity to one in between, so between one and two, and after two, so from two to infinity. And now you're just ready to evaluate your, your, um, your sign table. Again here, if you're clever, the exponential terms they're always going to be strictly positive. So the thing that will only define the sine of f prime is the one minus x. So if you pick a number before one, let's say zero, one minus zero is going to be positive. So we have a plus, and then after zero, after one, if you pick, for example, two, one minus two is going to be negative. With one evaluation here, we have the same sign. There's just two evaluation to do before the zero and after the zero. You can do it for a number between one and two at two and also after two, but you're just going to get three minuses. So it's going to take you three more times. And then for F prime, if you pick a number before two, like zero, and zero minus two is going to be negative. So it with one evaluation, I get these three negative right away. And if you pick a number bigger than two, let's say you pick three, three minus two, you're just going to get plus afterwards. So now we're ready to construct our arrows. So the first interval from minus infinity to one, the function is increasing uh, because of the plus for f prime, but it's a concave down because of the minus for f prime prime. So we have a function that is increasing concave down. And then for one to two, what do we have now? Well, we have a function that is now decreasing because of the minus, so the function is decreasing because of the minus for f prime, but it's also concave down because of the minus for f prime prime. So there's only one arrow that is decreasing concave down. And then what's going on at one, you can see you're on top of a, of a mountain. This is a nice local maximum. And then for the last interval, because f prime is negative, I know this function is decreasing. And because of the plus, it's decreasing concave up. There's only the plus for f prime prime. There's only one arrow that is decreasing concave up. What's up at two here? Well, at two, we have an inflection point. We have a change of concavity. And again, here, you can already kind of see the shape. Okay, so, um, so we have two important points that we use to create our table one and two. So one and two are going to be uh, in my sixth step. So I want to know what's the y value at one. I want to know what's the y value at two. And because zero is in the domain here, I'm going to also compute the y value at zero. And if you do that using, of course, the initial function, so you're going to get the output poof. So at one, it's 0 0.37. At two, it's 0 0.27. And at zero, it's just zero. So remember here, I'm just using the original function. Okay, so the original function, which is um, the function f of x 
equal x e to the minus x. So step six is just about computing y values. Okay, so with the important points. So now for the last step, so the exciting step here. So for step seven, okay, so for step seven, what we're doing now is we start with our points. So again, here when you're making your own graph, make sure that the x axis and the y axis um, will display for, will display well the important points that you computed. So I need something that will include one, two, and zero for the x's and for f of x for the y. I need zero point two seven and point three. So this is why for my y value I have like a nice uh, y axis that contains values between zero and zero point five. Now I have my three points already drawn from step six. I know there's a vertical asymptote, uh, sorry, horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So one of the first thing I do is I draw asymptotes, if any. So I draw the asymptotes. And there we go. Of course, when you draw an asymptote, this comes with an equation. So y equals zero. So that was found with my second limit here. So y equal zero. Um, that was the only asymptote that we found. So now we're ready to connect the dots, okay, with the um, with the, uh, the 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 table five. So I know my function is increasing concave down from minus infinity to one. So you start from minus infinity here. You're increasing, going through the origin, and then you're reaching that local maximum. So that's my first branch. Then the function is decreasing, still concave down, decreasing concave down, and finally reaching my Inflection point, the function will continue to decrease. Oh, wait, yeah. will continue to decrease, but now it's concave up and it's getting closer to that horizontal asymptote. And that's the graph for my function f of x. And um, again, when you're looking at when you look at your graph, make sure, make sure, and that's really crucial here, make sure that the graph is consistent with the domain. I can see here my function has no vertical asymptote, no holes. I can actually draw this graph in one shot without lifting my pen. It's continuous over its domain. Um, what about the important limits? If I label them in red, we found that the limit as x goes to minus infinity was minus infinity. And I see it here on my branch going down forever. And the limit going to infinity was zero. When I see my graph here, the branch is getting closer to the horizontal asymptote. So the two important limits are well reflected in this graph. And what about the shape? I see the graph is increasing from minus infinity to one, then it's decreasing from one to infinity. So there's a local maximum at one. The function is concave down from minus infinity to two and then concave up. There's an inflection point at two. So that shape of that graph is really consistent with the shape that we found slash computed in step five. So always check, is my graph consistent with domain, important limits, and the super sign table? And of course, the beautiful thing with this question is that in the important limits, we had to use hospital rule to get uh, the, the limit as x was going to infinity. But anyways, for that graph, that's it. That's all. Bye-bye.